Okay, so it's that kind of morning. Let's play a little game, okay? You ready? I'm going to say a word, and you get to say either science, if you think the word is related to science, or religion, if you think the word is related to religion, okay? You can yell it out. You ready? Faith. Experiment. Reverence. <laughs> Knowledge. Sacred. Awe. <laughs> I know it was not a fair game, was it? <laughs> but I grew up in a world where science and religion, I was told, were not supposed to cross paths. That there was a line between the two. Maybe you did too. I remember there always seemed to be this sense that one must pick one side or the other. Either you were going to be practical, intellectual, guided by reason, and develop your opinions based on good, reproducible evidence, or, or you were a person of faith, accepting as truth that which could be sensed through emotions and intuition, and which utilized myth and ritual to create meaning. Well, much to my father's chagrin, at the age of 22, I picked the mystical side of things and moved into a spiritual community to find my people. I made the move not because I didn't m find merit in science, but because with yoga, I had experienced a feeling of something so vast that it felt beyond anything that I thought science could explain. On so many occasions, I experienced what I called a state of awe, and I felt that an emotion that large must belong to the realm of mysticism. And so that was the path I chose. Little did I know at the time, but the very same feeling, that very same feeling that drew me to be a yogini was what many scientists would write about, especially later in their careers. They would write about it talking about how it, that feeling, drew them to science. In Unweaving the Rainbow, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins writes this. He says, the feeling of awed wonder that science can give us is one of the highest experiences of which the human psyche is capable. It is truly one of the things that makes life worth living. And Albert Einstein once wrote, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. It is the power of all true art and science. And he goes on to write, he to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. The conservationist Rachel Carson identified awe as a source of resilience in difficult times, writing, those who dwell among the beauties and mysteries of the earth are never alone or weary of life. Charles Darwin, Darwin expressed awe for his theory of natural selection at the end of his first edition of Origin of Species back in 1859. And many astronauts have seen the Earth from space. They describe an all that has been coined the name overview effect. Seeing the overview of the planet from so far away radically shifted many of their perspectives about life and let them, left them in a state of perpetual awe. So the truth is, from Copernicus to deGrasse Tyson and everybody in between, science is filled with stories of how awe and wonder had been the catalyst and often the result of scientific discovery. And yet I think too often science is told to stay clear of the mystical states of being, dismissing them as unmeasurable and not quite real. Leave that to the religious leaders or philosophers, they say. And I will admit that religious texts are filled with stories that are pretty easy to brush aside, right? After all, they're just not true, right? So where is the merit in them? 
And so here is this challenge for us as Unitarian Universalists. We pride ourselves in being a reasonable people. We do not want to dwell in places of untruth. We want to face reality and do something about it. And so too often, Unitarian Universalist faces, I think, shy away from that mythical state for fear of what it may say about our intelligence. If we all walked around being in awe, we might bump into a wall or people might see us as just spacey. But my proposal today for us is that we relook at this stance that we consider the possibility that science and mysticism are closer kin than we have thought. And my proposal is that as Unitarian Universalists, we should not shy away from either, since they both are born from that same small three-letter word, awe. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I wrestle with many religious texts. Some faiths like to look at these stories as literal, and that indeed pose, poses a problem for me. But what if the authors, the actual authors of these stories, were not going for a documentary level of truth-telling? What if the purpose of scripture was instead to simply initiate a feeling, a feeling so strong that it would compel one to action? What if scripture was really just about awe? In the Hebrew Bible, Moses stands on Mount Sinai in the presence of a burning bush that is not consumed by the fire. His awe at that sight was so profound that he removed his shoes, acknowledging that he was on sacred ground. And then he was compelled to do what the bush told him to do and go save an enslaved people. To me, that speaks of awe in action. In Hinduism, we're given many stories of amazing feats from gods and goddesses, acts of immense sacrifice and beauty that are intended to act with, that are intended to help us act like them, to be like the gods and act with sacrifice. Buddhism tells this amazing story of what happens to one man under a Bodhi tree and how he is transformed, enlightened into the Buddha, paving the way for our own practice of dispassion. It is meant to inspire us with awe. And these stories, are they just myths? Well, sure, but I think they're also metaphors, stories that wake us up that take us right to the edge of our understanding and give us a little push, challenging us to go beyond, to draw us into action. We are not meant to know how it all works, right? Are we? Imagine if you knew right now how everything worked in the whole universe. You had all the answers. How boring would that be? Life is designed to put us right at that edge so that we stay awake staying awake to the mystery. And to me, I call that mysticism. Some may call it science. What if there was a god called Kanesh who cleared the obstacles in front of us with a sweep of a trunk? That would be so cool, right? What if oceans really did part or bushes burned? Religious stories are one way to just awaken us to the possibility of awe. But indeed, science is another, nature is another, right? Have you ever watched lightning strike or been at the Grand Canyon or witnessed the miracle of birth or death or just laid outside and gazed up at the stars and been filled with that sense of, wow, just wow. And you ask, how is that possible? And then some people go out and try to find out. And some people just sit in the feeling of awe. But without awe, I think we wouldn't even notice. Well, what is awe? And can it be this healing salve I think it can be? Recently, and I actually have to admit, I decided on this sermon title before I noticed this book came out, but then I bought the book. Dr. D uh, Dacher Keltner, who's a research director of psychology at the UC Berkeley, 
He authored this new book on awe, and he offers this definition. He says, awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your understanding of the world. He says, awe imbues people with a different sense of themselves, one that is smaller, more humble, and part of something larger. When do you feel that? Right? When was the last time you had that feeling of awe? For so many scientists, it's this feeling of wonder and awe at the natural world, the workings of light, of time, of space, that draws them to want to experiment with it, to study it. For many in science, the world is about being on that leading edge of exploration, being right where the questions seem too big to answer, right? That's what keeps them alive. And that describes exactly my spiritual experiences and why I'm attracted to a mystical path. During meditation and yoga and while chanting in a group and at the feet of my guru, I always feel this unexplainable sense that, that I'm just small and also everything all at the same time. So personal and yet not. I love this quote about all from the neuroscientist, I'm sorry, he's a neuropsychologist, uh, Nicholas Humphrey. He defines awe as an experience of such perpetual vastness, you literally have to reconfigure your mental modes of the world to assimilate it. So is that science or spirituality? Right? I think it's both. In my experience, the spiritual path is one of constantly reconfiguring my mental states, my mental models of myself and the world. I watched a video the other day of a group of scientists talking about awe, and they all got this amazing twinkle in their eye, their eye when they spoke about the feeling of discovering something. They spoke about how right when they're on that edge and when they realize that they've come up with something that no one else has, it's like ecstasy for them. They look like a little kid alone in a candy store, excited by the possibilities. Science is beginning to study and acknowledge the power of this awe, and I'm glad. And just in the nick of time, because I think as a society, we're starting to move away from it. Instead of nature, we're filling our days with virtual re reality. Instead of accepting myth as a way to engage ourselves, we want to know the facts and the truth about everything. But maybe science and religion can actually come together and acknowledge at the core of human aliveness is this experience of awe. They just have two different ways to approach it. Now, recent studies, because scientists do like to study things, so they are studying awe, they found that it actually has some quantifiable benefits. It seems to move us from individualistic and self-centered behavior towards more collective interest. There was one study where researchers had a group of students stand in this grove of eucalyptus trees. They're the tallest trees in North America. And they were told to just stand beneath the trees and look up for 90 seconds. Another group of students were told to stand and look in the direction of one of the buildings for 90 seconds. And then the researchers arranged for each group of students to encounter somebody who stumbled and dropped a bunch of pens. And sure enough, the students who had been gazing at the awe-inspiring trees were far more likely to help the person pick up the pens. They also reported feeling less self-entitled than the other group did. Now, many more studies have yielded similar results to this impact of how we feel after all and how we act. Studies have found that experiences of, fall of all may improve our relationship with time by anchoring us in the present moment, making us feel we are rich in time rather than always running out of it. Who needs some of that? All is also shown to boost creativity and improve scientific thinking. Einstein once claimed that experiences of all are the source of true art and science. But these changes in us due to awe are not just random. Dr. Keltner found that awe activates the vagal nerves, which is this cluster of neurons in the spinal cord that regulate various, various bodily functions. So when we have that experience of awe, our heart rate actually slows down. Our digestion is relieved, 
and we actually begin to breathe a little deeper. And here's something most of us can use. Dr. Keltner's study found that all seems to quiet our negative self-talk in our brains. It deactivates that part of the brain that wants to have commentary on ourselves about everything we do. Does anybody need that? So there's so many ways to feel all, right? I'm wondering what yours are. The ocean, being out in a storm, witnessing birth or death, stargazing, canyons, geysers, cathedrals, forests, Yo-Yo Ma, Van Halen, I don't know. Somebody, right? Remember that first rock concert you went to? Okay, and now everybody's smiling. <laughs> now I know my audience. In Dr. Keltner's book, he writes about his research in which he actually asked thousands of people from different parts of the world what inspired them to this feeling of awe. The responses were wide and varied, but the number one response that he got from people across all nationalities was simply that they were mostly awed by other human beings. Watching others do great things, hearing stories of others' braveries, elicits this feeling of awe. Okay, Claude, I promised I would only talk about this person once in one sermon the whole time I was here. So this is my one time, and then I promise to never mention his name again. But you see, speaking of awe, for the past eight years, my family has sat in something between wonder and, I would say, dismay each Sunday as they watched their peace-loving mama excitedly watch football. Decidedly not a peaceful sport. But it was not just any football I had fallen in awe with. It was the experience of watching one particular football player and his team. <laughs> That's right, Tom Brady. Now, now that he has retired, I hope it's okay to say his name from the pulpit, I promise, just this one time. But people would ask me why, like, what is going on with you, Mom? Why are you watching football? And not just watching it, but getting pretty involved, you know, translation, yelling and jumping at the TV and uh, pacing around on occasion. Well, the truth is, it was a spiritual experience of awe for me. Every time Brady, and I know others do it as well, but for me, every time Brady threw one of those passes, you know, way down the field and Jillian Edelman was there or Gronk or lately Mike Evans, and they would just kind of catch this ball seemingly out of nowhere. Are you with me? Do you, do you, right? Should I act it out a little bit? Like, throw the ball. And, yeah. And she's like, it's just there. I'm like, how did they do that? It just inspired. And every time his team would be down by some seemingly insurmountable number of points, not to mention any particular Super Bowls, he would march that ball, I said just one time, okay? He would march that ball down the field over and over again. I would feel such a rush of energy. Because the truth is I wanted and needing that feeling of all. I actually remember crying once when uh, we didn't have television and we couldn't figure out how to get the game on on a Sunday afternoon. Like, I'm like literally in tears. <laughs> and I was like, that's interesting. Because <laughs> I recognized there was something that I was experiencing in that moment. You know, there was something that uplifted me that was this kind of like, oh, wow, moment. Because to be fair, I am a fair weather friend of Tom Brady's. I often will turn off a game if he is not giving me the all that is in our relationship agreement he should give me. <laughs> but it's not just watching others do inspiring things. It's also doing those things together that people report it, giving them a sense of awe, coming together in community, making a difference in the world, changing just injustices are, are all inspiring. And the studies show it is where we find the most awe in being together. Now, sometimes awe finds us in those unexpected moments, in a sunset, or hearing music, or watching football. But at other times, finding awe, it does take a conscious decision to see it. We must look around our lives with eyes of wonder and an attitude of, wow. So let's do that. Let's practice that right now. Everybody take a moment and be like, wow, I woke up today. Like, seriously. 
Do you know how many things had to work for that to happen? Wow. Someone designed this pulpit. They figured it out. They, like, put all the things in. Someone figured this out and this and that and that. And there's, like, air, right? What is this air? I don't feel like you're feeling it. I'm going to stand up here till you feel it. I want you to feel it. Feel all. What is it for you? Look at the person beside you. Wow. Parents, you do this all the time to your kids. Kids, look at your mommy. I'm not going to call names. Yeah, there you go. Wow. Look at your daddy. Wow. Look at your partner. They showed up with you. Wow. More than once. What? Even after you said that thing and did that thing. It's amazing to be alive. Right? And that feeling of awe. We can call it religious. We can call it science. But the science is showing if we don't engage with it, we have lesser lives. Our lives become mundane. Our lives become just one more thing we have to do to check it off our list. Now, it is not explicitly listed as one of our sources, but I'm going to invite you to pull out your order of service if you have one and take this six sources of our faith and some point today when you have a pen, I want you to take a pen and I want you to over top of those sources put A, W, E and underline it. Because what if this faith had that as its primary source? And from there you can do whatever you want. Be a scientist, study all you want. Be a mystic and meditate. But let all be the source of what we do. Theologian, philosopher, and author of God in Search of Meeting, Abraham Herschel, wrote in 1955, he said, modern man fell into the trap of believing that everything can be explained, that reality is a simple affair which has only to be organized in order to be mastered. I love a good spreadsheet. I love order. But all has something different. Let's claim all as one of the true sources of this faith, a faith that welcomes and loves science as much as mysticism, a faith that loves finding answers as much as it enjoys sitting in the mystery. In the words of Neil deGrasse Tyson, we are stardust brought to life then empowered by the universe to figure itself out. And we have only just begun. <laughs>